Welcome back to BioClass Bytes. In this video, we are going to talk about a brief history of genetics. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. This series is part of Grade 8 Biology Unit on Mendelian Genetics. Here are some recommended websites that you can visit. First would be Learn.Genetics, Genetic Science Learning Center. They have a lot of uh, topics um, about genetics and I'll provide the link in the description below. This one is from Science Learning Hub. They also have a lot of topics and areas that cover genetics and its different um, fields and application. Again, I'll provide the link in the description below. This video is an introduction, Genetics Basics Introduction. Um, a very interesting video that will provide you everything that you will need for this entire unit. I'll provide the link in the description below. And this one is from National Geographic, Genetics 101. Again, an introduction to genetics. And lastly, a cartoon the Cartoon Guide to Genetics by Larry Gonick and Mark Willis. Um, this one is an interesting um, re uh, book to read and I hope you will find uh, it enjoyable. Uh, again, I'll provide the link in the description below. In the past, um, our ancestors, primitive people, they have no distinction between living and non-living things. However, they, were all, um, they must have observed one obvious fact that organisms tend to reproduce uh, by themselves. And they were able to see the connection between sex, conception, and reproduction of plants and animals around them, which led to domestication. So domestication of plants and animals um, mostly talk about selective breeding. They select which organisms to breed. Okay? So our ancestors, the early herders, they controlled the animals mating by choosing the best organisms or the best individual within their herd and um, uh, uh, making them reproduce and getting rid of those unwanted characteristics. And they were... Uh, able to do that, for example, here they were able to domesticate the wild mouflon, the ancestor of the, of uh, domesticated sheep. So through domestication and selective breeding, they only choose the um, organisms who will reproduce. And over successive generations, they were able to remove the the worst or the undesirable traits, such as having long horns or aggressive behavior, and then the um, dark fur into uh, a docile and woolly uh, domesticated sheep that we know today. Uh, so our ancestors were unaware that they are actually um, applying um, practical genetics in their selective breeding. Uh, they were also able to do that in um, pigs and we all know that the ancestors of pigs are, are wild boar, of domesticated pigs are wild boars and of modern day dogs are the descendants of wolves in the past and other examples so selective breeding was also extended to plants so for example here um, cauliflower broccoli cabbage and kale and kohlrabi are all products of selective breeding the wild mustard okay so the wild mustard um, through domestication through selective breeding our ancestors were able to uh, produce th these different varieties of this plant right? just by choosing which um, organisms they want to breed. Weeds and grasses were turned into rich and productive crops. Rice, wheat, and barley were improved in Asia, while yams and peanuts were cultivated in Africa. So to learn more about the history of um, selective breeding and domestication, both of plants and animals, I recommend that you visit this video from um, Scientific American entitled, What is a Genetically Modified Food? I'll provide the link in the description below. This video is from PBS Eons entitled, How, Do How We Domesticated Cats Twice, an interesting video that talks about you know, how um, humans domesticated cats or is it the other way around. I'll provide the link in the description below. So aside from selective breeding and domestication, here are some of the initial ideas that our ancestors used to have about genetics. Hindus observed that certain diseases tend to run in the family 
and some of them believe that children inherit all the characteristics of their parents. In the laws of Manu, it says there that a man of base descent can never escape his origins. So a man of low descent. Okay. So if you remember, no, there was a caste system or um, social classes uh, categorization in India back in the day, and I think we they still have it nowadays. So the laws of Manu states that if you are born into a low class family, you can never escape that um, class. Early Greeks also wondered why children resemble their parents, and Socrates um, wondered why they sometimes. That's why they sometimes do not. Do not. So he used to say that the sons of great statesmen or politicians or senators were usually lazy and, as using his own words, good for nothing. The most coherent Greek theory of heredity was from Hippocrates. Okay? Uh, he recognized that the male contribution to a child's heredity is carried by the semen, and he assumed that there's also a similar fluid found in women. Um, so if, you, if you're familiar with, hi, with him, he made a lot of uh, discoveries about the human body, and he, he was actually one of the first um, well-known practitioner, practitioners of medicine in ancient Greece. Hippocrates reasoned that these two fluids, semen in males and a similar fluid in females, um, were made in the body and are collected in the reproductive organs. And during sexual intercourse, upon the secretion of those fluids, there will become a battle of the fluids, um, as well as containing possibly the parents' traits. And the winner uh, of that battle will be inherited and will be manifested by the child. So more or less, no, he already has... Um, even if it is quite vague, he already has an idea about dominant and recessive traits and how they are expressed in the offspring. Aristotle also had um, another idea on heredity. He believed that the male semen determined the baby's form or the baby is already contained in the semen. Okay? And the mother uh, merely provided the material or the environment for the baby to grow. Uh, he also implied that all, since all um, babies are created or, or are found in the male semen, that all children should be boys. Um, but the existence of female babies um, were caused by interference or disturbance, possibly from the mother's uh, blood. Okay. However, we all know that this is not true. This, the sex of the baby is actually determined by the chromosome that is donated the type of sex chromosome that is donated by the father into the egg cell, okay? So, there. Now, um, after um, some time, no, nothing much um, progressed in the field of genetics, even in this field has not yet been created yet, but these are the uh, related events. So, in 1648, Anton, Anton Van, Philips Van Leeuwenhoek, um, with his microscope, was able to dis discover uh, the sperm cell and the theory of preformed organism, wherein a small individual is already contained inside the sperm cell. And that small person uh, just grows inside the female's womb, okay? Similar to what Aristotle was um, saying initially. 1649, William Harvey looked, um, had a quest and successfully found uh, the mammalian egg cell. 1694, Camararius discovered that plants also have sex organs, and in 1876, Hertwig observed the, uh, that sea urchin undergo fertilization. So these are the gathered facts no, as of um, this time, 1870s. Um, these are, this is what was established in the scientific community. Some stable varieties nearly always breed offspring having the same characteristics as their parents. It means that if the if the variety, for example, or the stable trait of being tall is is um, seen among all the population, then it's it's not it has higher probability that it will be shown in the offspring or it will be present in the offspring. It is possible to mate parents from two different varieties to form a hybrid. So it is possible to mate a tall. Um, organism with a short organism, so two different varieties to form um, a someone with a middle height, whether it's a plant or an animal 
it's it's possible to find somewhere in between a, a hybrid of the two varieties all varieties even stable ones could occasionally produce an offspring different from each parent so it's possible that even if two parents um, are tall uh, there's a chance that they could have a short uh, child sometimes the offspring differs only slightly but others are considered to be abnormal or are slightly or, or, or are greatly different from their parents so these are just uh, some of the gathered facts or established facts that scientists have during this time however despite a great deal of work um, as mentioned no truly general laws of heredity were established at this point some investigators or scientists confused themselves by crossing too many breeds others failed to keep a careful count on the number of vari varieties that they were working on so nothing not nothing much progress in the field of heredity um, and gradually scientists gave up trying uh, and they, they um, turned to easier problems that easier problems to solve until Gregor Mendel and we will talk more about Gregor Mendel in our next video that's the end of our first video I hope you learned something new don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video till next time goodbye